Okay, so it's a great pleasure to introduce Brad Rogers from Queen's University. And he's going to talk about the distribution of random polynomials with multiplicative coefficients. Okay. Thank you, Brad, for accepting our invitation. Yeah, thank you for having me. Is it, is it already recording? It didn't make an announcement. It is, okay. Okay. Yes, it's uh, recording. Okay, great. Uh, so yeah, thanks a lot for, for having me. Um, it's a great pleasure to be speaking here. What I'll be talking about is um, some questions about the distributions of random polynomials where the coefficients are multiplicative coefficients. So the distribution of random polynomials is a classic topic and um, the, what we'll be considering is, is sort of a, a variant on that. All right, so I'll start off with some examples of this, of uh, these sorts of polynomials. But just to make sure everyone's on the same page, let me start off by setting the stage. Okay, so a function on the integers, we say this is completely multiplicative. If it's the case that it splits apart, f of mn equals f of m times f of n for all n and m. And the sort of question that we're interested in asking is for a typical completely multiplicative function f. What does the trigonometric polynomial with coefficients f of n look like as theta varies? Okay, so. As I'll show in a minute um, with a few examples, it's, it's a relatively natural question to ask from the perspective of number theory. So here is the first example of this sort of polynomial. These arise uh, naturally in the circle method. So it's a non-standard name, but I call these uh, Liouville polynomials. These are just polynomials where the coefficients are the Liouville function. Um, and equivalently, you could get basically the same, same question if you replace it with the Mobius function. Like I say, this arises in the circle method, but you can ask the question, uh, what does this look like as theta varies around the unit circle? So let me switch, um, switch the screen share here just for a moment and show you what this looks like. Okay, so what I've done here, um, I've plotted this Louisville polynomial, um, normalized it by a factor, it's in de degree n, where n, uh, I chose it to be uh, 1,030, and I normalize it by the square root of n. So what I'm plotting here is 2,000 points around, uniformly spaced around the unit circle. I send them through this, uh, through this polynomial and just plot the output. Okay, so this is this is the picture you get, and if anybody's read like a statistics uh, textbook, you might recognize this image. Does anybody does anybody have a guess about what this what this image what this distribution actually is? It's a pretty common one. So this is just uh, just a picture basically of Gaussian noise. So um, this uh, picture here is the is the output for the Louisville polynomials, but if I plot um, 2,000 points distributed like a standard complex normal, mean zero variance one, on the next slide, okay, you see it looks almost identical. They are, you can see if I flip back and forth, they're different pictures, all right, 
but they look basically the same. Okay, so this is um, this is a conjecture one would want to make, which is that for any rectangle um, in the complex plane, as n goes to infinity, the proportion of time that these polynomials, uh, the measure of theta in between zero and one, that these polynomials spend inside that rectangle, is just given by this Gaussian measure. So this is the the density function. Um, for a complex Gaussian with mean zero and variance one. All right, um, and I say any rectangle here, that's just for convenience, um, you, any, any nice set inside the complex plane, you'd expect this limiting distribution. Okay, um, so you can ask that question. Another interesting question that, um, that arises in the circle method is, what is the supremum of these polynomials? How large do they get? as theta varies around the unit circle. So again, I'll switch back to some numerical evidence here. So here I'm just looking at the maximum as theta goes around the unit circle of these trigonometric polynomials normalized by the square root of n. Um, and this is, this is what the data looks like. Okay, so you see it's growing, but it's growing very slowly. Uh, and the typical conjecture one makes is that this should be of size square root of log n. You can see the data fits that relatively, relatively closely. Okay, so here's our conjecture that as n goes to infinity, the maximum of these is proportional to the square root of n log n. It may even be reasonable to conjecture that this is asymptotic to the square root of n log n. Um, I didn't compute data for that large of n. Um, the data that I showed you didn't really seem to suggest that this is an asymptotic formula, but um, computing it for a longer range of n might, might show that to be the case. Okay, so we'll see that this uh, square root of n log n um, is, is actually kind of a, a universal feature of these sorts of problems. So I'll say a bit more about that, uh, about that later. Okay, any, any questions so far with this? Okay, so that's one example of uh, um, a polynomial, a typical polynomial with multiplicative coefficients. Um, another famous example is that of Fekete polynomials. So these are polynomials um, which have degree only p minus one, where p is a prime, and their coefficients are just Legendre symbols. All right, so, so these are uh, multiplicative, at least in the range n goes from one to p minus one. And you can ask the same question, how do these distribute? So again, I'll show you an image of this. I look at, uh, now I'm looking at uh, prime equals uh, 1031. And I plot these polynomials normalized by the square root of the degree at 2000 points equally spaced around the unit circle. And uh, you can see here that it's a very different graph. So this definitely doesn't, doesn't look Gaussian anymore. Um, it's a very different distribution. Okay, um, so you can still ask about the, the distribution. I mean, can you, can you disprove the fact that it's Gaussian? Um, and in fact, uh, you can. So this is a result of uh, Gunther and, and Schmidt um, from a few years ago. I didn't write down the year here, but I think this is 2017, I think, I'll quote me on that. Um, what they found is a, is a closed formula for all the moments. Um, and uh, the formula is definitely not Gaussian. It's, it's some complicated thing over a, a sum over set partitions, that sort of thing. Um, but it's, it's not Gaussian moments. Um, People oftentimes ask me about this, are the moments that they get enough to determine the distribution? I actually have to confess, I, I, didn't, um, I didn't check this rigorously. I believe that they are though. I believe that the, the moments they compute are enough to determine, they, they grow slowly enough that you can determine the distribution from it, but that, that should be independently checked. In any case, the moments are, are not Gaussian. Okay. Um, 
So you can ask the same question, uh, likewise about the about the growth of these polynomials. So again, I won't switch back and forth like this the whole talk, just at the beginning. Um, so here you can ask, uh, what is the maximum value on the unit circle normalized by the degree? And I plot this for the first 100 primes and uh, I normalize it by the, the square root. Okay, normalized by the square root of the degree. So here's the plot and then I'm comparing this to the square root of log P. And actually that, that seems to be a, a fairly good fit to me. Um, but you know, it's a, it's a little bit lower, um, the, the normalized supernorms than the square root of log P. Uh, actually the, the conjecture, I'll write it down in a moment is that this should be about a size log log p. So the, the numerics are not, are not so great for that though. Okay, but let me write that down. So here, the, um, the conjecture is due to Montgomery in a, in a paper in the, in the 70s, that this soup norm should be about a size square root of p times log log p. So that's that's a smaller size. As to what's um, as to what's rigorously known here, Montgomery proved a few results. So he showed that um, the soup norm is at least this size of square root of p times log log of p, and he showed that it is no more than the square root of p times log p. So it's a relatively accurate determination, but there's still a lot of, there's a big gap between these, so between these two. I have to say for my part, I'm not, I'm not actually convinced this conjecture is right. I think here it may still be uh, of order square root of p times log p, though, though I would guess if there's an asymptotic formula, the constant isn't one. Um, but in any case, this, this still seems to be the, the widely held belief. Okay. Any, any questions here so far? So all of this motivates, you see there's, there's sort of drastically different behavior between these two examples. All of this sort of motivates the question, what is the typical behavior uh, for the distribution of these sorts of polynomials with, uh, with typical random multiplicative coefficients? Can I ask a question quickly? Sure, yeah. Um, is it possible to say briefly where this Montgomery conjecture comes from? Um, Why is it believed that log log p might be the correct answer? Right, so he has a sort of heuristic uh, heuristic description. Um, I'm afraid I don't remember the heuristic description very well, other than to say I was not especially convinced by it. Um, it comes from estimates. Oh, okay, so um if you evaluate this at um at roots of unity uh pth roots of unity it takes the size exactly square root of p um, so in that sense you might expect it to be smaller than um smaller th than the previous example um nonetheless just evaluating this at roots of unity is not enough to determine the size of it um, by Bernstein's inequality, which will play a role later. If you can do this at roots of p roots of unity, and then, well, also uh, two p roots of unity, um, then you get a good estimate on the, on the size of this. And he has a sort of heuristic argument involving estimates for, um, for character sums. It comes out to square root of p times log log p. Um, but I, I don't know that it, that it, actually the heuristic goes that much farther than just saying that this lower bound uh, is is what he could prove. Okay, thank you. Other other questions here? Okay. So hopefully this at least motivates the the sort of question that we'll be um, that we'll be thinking about. So it ends up that these sorts of questions have been studied um, studied long ago, at least in the case of not multiplicative coefficients, but uh, IID coefficients. So, 
So this is work of Solomon Zygmunt. Um, again, I didn't write down the date. I think this is the 1950s though. What they considered were polynomials with IID coefficients. So one takes Rn to be IID random variables. Nothing multiplicative about them. Each of these uh, taking values of plus one and minus one with equal probability. Actually, Solomon Zygmunt considers something more general than this, but I just want to consider this example for concreteness. And they define a polynomial Qn of theta to just be the degree n polynomial with these coefficients, degree n trigonometric polynomial. And they proved uh, a number of theorems about these, but I think the most interesting results they proved are theorem one. They showed that almost surely you have a Gaussian distribution for this as, there, as theta varies around the unit circle. So almost surely for any rectangle P inside the complex plane, as n goes to infinity, the proportion of time that this random polynomial at least once normalized by square root of n is going to spin inside that rectangle is just this Gaussian measure. Okay, so let me spend at least give you at least a few seconds to stare on this. If it's the first time you've seen this sort of thing, it could be a bit confusing. Note there are two sources of randomness. So first you have these, uh, these coefficients Rn, you select them randomly. So you've sort of uh, rolled the dice an infinite number of times, you've got these coefficients, then almost surely for those dice rolls, then you look at the proportion of time that these polynomials spend inside some given set. And that's that proportion of time is given by a Gaussian measure. Okay, so they showed that, which is consistent of the behavior we, we observed empirically for the Louisville polynomials. Um, and they also showed that almost surely, actually I should, I'll amend this in a second. Almost surely one has that the maximum value of these polynomials as you go around the unit circle is square root of n times log n. Let me mention here, so Solomon Zygmunt um, showed that the order of this maximum is square root of n log n, the result that it's uh, asymptotic to square root of n log n is actually due to loss. Okay. So let me briefly just say a few words about the square root of n log n. Um, this is something that uh, appears quite frequently when you're looking at the maximum of random processes. It ends up that if, you're, if you have n independent Gaussians, um, let's just say that they're, they're real Gaussians of mean zero and variance one, and you look at the maximum of these Gaussians, uh, that will typically be of order square root of log n. Okay, so, so this up to normalization square root of log n factor is something that's, that's almost universal. Um, that said, the asymptotic, this being asymptotic to square root of n log n, uh, that was, like I say, was first proved by Halas. And to me, this doesn't seem to be terribly, Halas's proof doesn't seem to be terribly well incorporated into the, into the probabilistic literature. It, it'd be good to go back and sort of revisit Halas's proof and then smooth things over, I think. Um, finally, one last thing to say about this result is that the, um, the same results are true um, a bit more broadly. I mentioned the coefficients can be chosen independently, but essentially arbitrarily. Um, for our purposes, I'll just mention 
that these same results are true if the coefficients still are independent. That's very important. But if instead of being plus minus one, they're uniformly distributed around the unit circle. In that case, these, these theorems remain identically the same. Okay, any questions on the statement of this result? So, there are by now many ways to, to prove these uh, to prove these theorems. Um, I'm going to mention the way that will be relevant for us. I go through this because we'll use the same ideas later. So um, it's a bit easier to talk about the proof in the case that the uh, coefficients are uniformly distributed around the unit circle. So I'll discuss that. And one way to do this is just to use the moment method. So one just wants to consider the average value of the moments around the unit circle the mixed J and K powers of these normalized polynomials. Here I should put a conjugate in. Okay, so what we're computing here is for any laying down of the coefficients, you just consider this is a polynomial in the unit circle. You compute the normalized moments, then you take the average value of that. And you wanna show that this gives the answer of k factorial when j equals k, and it gives zero otherwise. In other words, you just want to show that these moments match up with Gaussian moments. And in the second place, you want to show that this quantity, without the expectation in front, this is a random quantity, you want to show that it somehow concentrates around, around these values. Okay, so, so a quick way to do that, there, there are lots of different ways that you can show for fixed J and K that this concentrates around its mean value. There's some concentration of measure results that, have, that apply quite directly, but a sort of unsophisticated way to do it is just to compute the variance of this, of this integral. Okay. and show that this is, uh, is small, whatever small might mean. All right, that shows that whatever value this is getting, it's, it's, uh, these moments are concentrating around the mean value and on average they're Gaussian. And so then you can show that almost surely they're Gaussian with just a little bit of work from this. Okay. Does that strategy make sense? Okay, so I leave unsaid for this slide at least how to compute that, but that's what I'll show you on my next sheet of paper. So in order to show this, um, this in D1, uh, it's not, a, it's not a very deep computation, but we'll use the same idea later, so we might as well run through it. To show this, quantity we're looking to compute let's just say that we're considering only the most interesting case when the mixed moments are equal we want to compute this if we just expand these two k powers this ends up being equal to a 
the sum over KMs and the sum over KNs. Here I'd better go to a different line. It's going to be a sum of the coefficients Rm1 multiplied out to Rmk and Rn1 multiplied out to Rnk conjugate times just the exponentials, which if I collect all these in one place will be a sum of all the m's minus the sum of all the n's times theta. Okay. That's just the conjugate polynomials, the minus signs here. Okay, um, and if I compute this expected value, okay, in the first place, when I integrate in theta, I'm gonna have to ensure that the sum of the m's equals the sum of the n's, but then here, well, I won't run through it in depth, but if you're familiar with this sort of thing, just from the central limit theorem via the moment method, you find that the only time these terms aren't gonna be equal to zero is when there's a matching between these sets M and N. That is M1 corresponds to one of these NIs, M2 corresponds to one of these NIs, et cetera. Okay, it's only those terms which survive. Right, and um, now uh, this isn't exactly equal to k factorial times n to the k, but it's, it's extremely close to it, right? Because you have k options for the first matching of m1, k minus one options to match up m2 and so on. At least roughly, that's, that's what you have. That ignores that there might be um, some of these m1s and m2s which are sometimes equal. Okay, uh, and this, this gives us exactly the predicted formula, right? This is exactly the Gaussian moment we're looking for. Okay, so that's that's theorem one. Um, without writing anything, let me at least mention how this how this approach can be uh, modified for theorem two of Solomon Zygmunt, that the order of this polynomial, uh, the order of the maximum of this polynomial is uh, square root of n times square root of log n. It ends up that this asymptotic relationship that the average value of these moments is around k factorial times into the k. This asymptotic relationship persists actually for quite large k. Okay, so it persists at least to the point where k is of size log n. And it's a feature here, I won't write down any of the details, but it's a feature of Bernstein's inequality for polynomials that if you can compute, well, always if you can compute large moments of some random thing, you can you can get close to computing the L infinity norm. Um, it ends up for a degree n polynomial if you can compute some moments which are of order log n, you can get very close to computing the L infinity norm. And so this asymptotic formula persists up to the size at least k equals log n, and that gives you very good information about the L infinity norms of these polynomials. So in that way, the same computation can can prove theorem two as well. All right, so this is the strategy that we'll, that we'll follow in, in discussing the same problem for random multiplicative functions. Are there any questions so far with this? Okay. So let me then... Just a quick question. So when you say that uh, the true is a feature of the fact that you can compute this for very large uh, values of k. Does it mean in, in this computation, the, 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 that uh, formula you get is uniform for a very large k or is it? Yeah, exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so the error term would be smaller than this. So up to this point, I mean, this is just an algebraic equality and then it's fairly easy to analyze what, what this actually equals. Yeah. Okay, um, my question was that there's nothing else to it. Um, 
No, essentially no. You can get so getting the asymptotic formula is harder, but getting the um, order of magnitude is is like this. So Solomon and Zygmunt do this slightly differently. They use exponential moments, and if you look in like Gahan's book or something, he'll he'll use the same proof. But it it morally relates to the fact that this formula is asymptotically true for k of size uh, of order log n. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So let me then move on to random multiplicative functions. I suppose most people in the audience here will be familiar with this. So, I'll, but just to make sure we're on the same page, um, I'll cover this quickly. Um, so in particular, I use a slightly different uh, definition than, than is typical. Uh, so I say that Xn is a Rademacher random multiplicative function. If um, for every prime, uh, you independently choose these by flipping a coin, plus one, minus one with equal probability. And then for composite in, um, you just multi multiply together all the, all the prime factors. So usually if you're familiar with the literature here, it, it's I think more common to say Rademacher random multiplicative function is supported on the square freeze. These are supported on, on all integers. Okay, so that said it doesn't, um, it doesn't make too much of a difference which of those two definitions you use. And then um, for, for Steinhaus random multiplicative functions, um, here our definition doesn't differ from the usual conventions. You have the same setup, uh, but you say that uh, these values of the primes are still independent, but they're uniformly distributed around the inner circle. Okay, any, any questions on this? So this is a typical way to um, to investigate what what is the typical distribution for a for a multiplicative function. It seems to be, in some cases, a good a good model for like the Mobius function, or if you're including uh, including non square free values for the Google function. Okay. So. What does one have here? The analog of Solomon Zygmunt's theorem is the following result, the theorem one. I'll state this first for Rademacher random multiplicative functions. Defines a polynomial P in of theta, just as we have been doing. So its coefficients are this random multiplicative function. And then almost surely, same as before for any rectangle P inside the complex plane. As n goes to infinity, the proportion of time on the unit circle that your output, your normalized output, spins inside some rectangle just tends to the, the Gaussian measure. Okay, and uh, the same theorem is true as well. For Steinhaus random multiplicative functions. Okay, so this, um, this theorem, we prove it in our paper, but we actually don't have priority on it. This theorem was first proved uh, by Adam Harper. And he proved it uh, using Martingale methods. So this was, this was never published, um, but he gave a few talks explaining how this is done. And our method um, was uh, was a different method. Uh, we instead gave a proof 
sort of along the lines I outlined in the last slide for IID variables, uh, we give a proof uh, via moments. One of the advantages of moments is that you get some uniformity in moments. Um, here, there, there's a subtle point I'll talk about later, but you get some uniformity in moments, and this can also be used to say something non-trivial about this sort of moment. But in any case, one sees from this that the, the Liouville function, that's sort of the typical example for a multiplicative function, and the, um, the Vicati polynomials are, are, are quite special in some sense. Okay. Before I jump into the proof, any questions here? Uh, so here, this function is, uh, as you said, is supported on all the integers. If it is supported on square-free integers, is this still well true? Yeah, so this theorem would still be true, though the, the normalization by square root of n wouldn't be the, the right thing. I guess it would be um, what this uh, 6 over pi squared times n down here. But yeah, the, the same theorem ends up being true. And the, the same, um, I think both of these uh, both of these methods could be modified back and forth between these between these cases. Okay. Other questions here? Okay, so let me explain to you how the how the um, the moment procedure works, because this depends on a. Um, a technique of Vaughn and Woolley that's uh, it's very beautiful, um, but it's also easy enough to explain that I can give a more or less complete explanation of it here in the lecture. Okay, so I'll work with um, the Steinhaus random multiplicative functions. These are a bit easier to deal with. So as before, what we want to show I'll just deal with the case of matched moments. So we want to show that the average value of the 2k moment of this polynomial around the unit circle is asymptotic to k factorial times into the k. At least that's the first thing we want to show. And let's just get to work computing what this is. We can follow the same, the same strategy we did in the IID case. If we just expand the two k moments here, well, this is equal to the expected value of the integral of a sum over k different m's and k different n's. And then have to also multiply this by the exponential terms. So it's the same thing we had before. You can collect these all into one term. It's the sum of the m's minus the sum of the n's. Times theta. Okay. So it's the sum of all these and then I suppose we have to integrate d theta as well. But what is this equal? Well, here it's a bit different than the IID case. Um, note that because these functions are uh, random multiplicative functions, we can combine this to just be x of m1 multiplied out to mk. Same thing over here. Um, so if we take the expected value, the only time we're going to get non-vanishing um, is when the products of the m's equal the product of the n's. On the other hand, if we integrate in theta, the only time we get non-vanishing there 
is if the sum of the m's equal the sum of the n's. Right? So this moment is just a reasonably natural problem to think about. We're just counting the number of solutions. in M and N's where the sum of the N's is equal to the sum of the N's and the product of the M's is also equal to the product of the N's. Okay, um, and if you think about this uh, for a little while, you see that the, you can break up solutions to this, to the system into some natural cases. So I break it up into the following two cases. In the first place, I consider the diagonal terms. That's where you just have a matching as we did in the IID case, where the set of M's match up exactly to the set of N's. And in fact, if you look at this for, um, for k equals two, I believe, you only get diagonal solutions. But once k equals three, you start getting off diagonal solutions. And these are just defined to be the solutions which are not matching. So what we're left with is estimating these, these diagonal solutions we estimated these before. This typically takes the value, I mean, it, it does asymptotically for fixed k, take the value k factorial times into the k. So what we're left with is showing that these off diagonal solutions make a smaller contribution. So that's, that's our strategy. It's easy to show. diagonal solutions have this asymptotic formula. And what we're left with showing if we want to show the central limit theorem is that the off diagonal solutions make a smaller contribution. And it ends up that for showing that the off diagonal solutions make a smaller contribution, there's a technique of Vaughn and Woolley, which ends up having been rediscovered uh, at least a few times. So it was independently rediscovered by Granville and Sander Arjun. Um, th there's, a, there's a simple technique for counting these off diagonal solutions. So this is what I'll take uh, a few minutes to explain here. So we make use of the following, uh, the following very nice lemma. What Vaughn and Woolley showed is that if I have um, a set of numbers, M1 and N1, or, I'm sorry, mi and ni, so that their products are equal. So that m1 multiplied out to mk equals n1 multiplied out to nk. Then there ends up being a k by k array of integers, a rs, so that the row products end up giving mr. That is to say, for instance, m1 is equal to a11 times A12 multiplied out to A1K. M2 is A21 times A22 multiplied out to A2K, so on. And the column products likewise give the NS. So N1 here is equal to A11 times A21 multiplied out to AK1 and so on. N2 is equal to A12, A22, AK2. I don't know. Okay, so it's obvious in the first place that if I do have this representation for my m's and n's, that if I multiply them together, the products are going to be the same. Uh, what's slightly less obvious is that I can sort of factorize my my collections of m and n's this way as long as I have this relation. But it ends up it's it's very easy to prove. So there's here's one way to see it: an inductive proof. Note that if all the m's and all the n's equal one, then of course you can do this. Just make all your aij's equal to one. On the other hand, 
if this product is bigger than one, then one of your MRs has to have some prime in common with one of your NSs. There has to be some prime P which divides both MR and NS. Okay, so in this table, write down a product P, uh, prime P, wherever that occurs, MR and NS, and then divide through both of these, divide through MR by P and NS by P, and pass back to an earlier case that you've already considered. Okay. And that way you can just fill in the entire table very easily. All right, so it's very simple to prove. It ends up up to sort of co-primality conditions. This factorization is, is basically unique. But this lemma ends up being essentially ready-made to, to solve the problem that we're after here. So let's, are there any questions about this procedure? So let's uh, pass back then to the problem that we want to estimate. Recall that we were interested in estimating off-diagonal solutions to uh, where we have a sequence of numbers m1 out to mk multiplied out to mk equals n1 multiplied out to mk, and then the sum of the m1s equals the sum of the nk. This is effectively the same thing as looking at the number of off diagonal solutions. Let's just replace all of the M's with uh, row products. So we want off diagonal solutions. Where are the products we're going to consider a k by k grid here, and the product a11 multiplied out to a1k plus all of the entries for each row out to a k1 multiplied out to a kk equals all of the column products a11 multiplied out to a k1 summed up to a k1 multiplied out to a k k where we're thinking of this as a k by k grid and the row products are less than or equal to n and the column products are likewise less than or equal to n all right now that i've gotten written down let me explain again what we're doing here we're considering uh, k by k rows of positive integers. Uh, the row products are supposed to correspond to the m's. The column products are supposed to correspond to the n's. So this ensures that m1 plus m2 out to mk equals n1 summed up to nk. The fact that we've factorized this into these, into these arrays means we've already taken care of the condition that the products of the m1s equals the product of the nk's. And then the fact that the row products are always less than or equal to n and column products are always less than or equal to n uh, takes care of the condition that we want to only look at mi's and MJ, nj's, which are less than or equal to n. Right, and what does off diagonal solutions mean? I mean, that just that there's not a matching between these products that I'm writing down here. So there's no matching between these k products and these k products. All right, so how do I handle this? Sorry, uh, does the lemma imply that the representation is unique? The AI just, um, is it obvious? It's, it's not actually necessarily uh, unique. Right? So okay. I'm, I'm cheating a bit here when I say this is equal. I guess I should say there's, you could at very least say there's an upper bound though. Yes, okay. Yeah. It's, it's essentially unique. You can think of it as being unique up to some co-primality, but it's, right. not, it's not good. Okay, so I'm cheating a little bit here and saying this is equal. And I'm going to cheat again here, this one a bit more severely. So I'll write a less than with a squiggly line. I claim that in thinking that the row products are less than n, this is just a product of k numbers. All those products of k numbers are less than n. Morally, you can think of that as meaning that every number in your array 
is less than n to the one over k. All right, that's not strictly true. I'll, I'll come back to that point later, but morally you can think that this is the case. All right, so that's one cheat. The other cheat which I'll make is to say that not having a matching here is morally the same as having that each of these numbers, each of these products here is distinct from each of these products appearing on the other side. All right, again, there's a bit of a cheat there, but it's not too much of a cheat. I'll come back to talk about it. So I claim that this is the same, that this A11, A12 out to A1K equals none of these A11 multiplied out to AK1s. But now what happens if you assume that? Well, I can take this, leave this expression on this side, subtract this expression so it's also on this side, and then move everything else to the other side. Note that this term and this term have in common A11. So rewriting this in that way, I have A11 multiplied by A12 multiplied out to A1K minus on the other side, A21 multiplied out to AK1 equals some expression, whatever is left, the sum of all these other, other entries. But note my reduction that I'm assuming that this A11 is equal to none of these in particular means that this product is not equal to this one. Okay, so factoring out the A11 term, it means that this product is not equal to this one. So this quantity that I'm computing over here is non-zero. That means that whatever entries I write down over here, there's gonna be at most one solution for A11. Right? So having filled in k squared minus one entries of this, of this table, the additive condition forces a relation on the A11 entry. All right, so here I move back to rigorous math. If A11 is determined in terms of the other k squared minus one entries and each of these ARSs is um, only taking size at most n to the one over k, the total number of solutions here is gonna be n to the one over k to the k squared minus one. And this is just equal to n to the k minus one over k. Recall we were trying to get a savings over k factorial times into the k and this, at least for fixed k, it does it. Okay, so I have only a few minutes left. Let me mention now where I'm cheating here. It ends up that the cheat of saying that the matching is, uh, is basically like saying all of these is distinct. That's not much of a cheat. Uh, if, if you sort of didn't have a matching, but you had some of these equal, you could just sort of set the M's in an equal and pass back to a, to a smaller K case. In short, that's not much of a cheat here. On the other hand, assuming that um, the row products being less than or equal to N implies that all of the entries are smaller than N to the one over K, that's definitely a cheat. It's sort of an analog, um, the divisor problem where you try to estimate the sum of, uh, of the function dn. Well, the dominant contribution there, you can think of it as sort of coming from, from a box, um, but that ignores logarithmic factors that, that come from the tail of these hyperbolas in the, in the Dirichlet trick. Um, so here too, that, that's, that's definitely a cheat. If you really kept track of everything rigorously, you end up with lots of factors of log n. In fact, you end up with something like uh, log n to the k squared power here if you keep track of everything. Um, Okay, but that, that doesn't, at least for fixed K, that doesn't, that doesn't overwhelm things and it still gives a proof. Uh, nonetheless, if K is growing, these, these tails do eventually play a big role. Um, and so it ends up that the furthest you can really push this method without much work um, is K is of size log N to the one third. And definitely these off diagonal contributions you can show quite rigorously do make a real contribution when k is bigger than log n to the one half. In that case, the sort of Gaussian estimate um, that, I, that we had for fixed k is, is just no longer true. Um, nonetheless, you can get that Gaussian estimate for k going up to uh, log n to the one third. And this is what we used to estimate the soup norm. So 
this is what I'll end on, but I think it's an interesting problem. And probably still quite approachable. I don't think we've exhausted uh, every technique for this. So what we were able to show is that for Xn, uh, a Rademacher or a Steinhaus random multiplicative function, then with probability one minus little o of one, we have the following bounds on the soup norm. We have a lower bound of log in, into the one half times log n to the one sixth minus epsilon. So the supremum is at least that large and a bit less um, interesting of a result. For an upper bound, it's at most a size into the one half times the exponential of log n to the one half plus epsilon. So this estimate is, is uh, easier and in fact doesn't really exploit any properties of this, uh, of this being on the unit circle. Um, nonetheless, I don't think this is the optimal result. I think it's probably true that Almost surely, the soup norm as before is still of size the square root of n times log n. One last thing to say, and then I'll then I'll stop talking. Um, this conjecture, I, I think, is is probably tractable. I don't think we've exhausted all the opportunities. Nonetheless, I don't think with a strictly like with a refinement of the moment method itself one can show this. I think the moments, um, they're much larger than in the IID case, and there's not the sort of concentration of measure that you have in the IID case. So I think the most that you could push the moment method with, with like a more careful analysis of, of the system of equations would be log into the one fourth. That's as good as you could hope to get with it. All right, so I'll leave it at that. Um, I think it's a very interesting problem though. And uh, so I hope people are interested to think about this. Thanks a lot. Thank, thank you, Brad, for the nice talk. Thank you. So we have time for question. Does anyone has a question? I think I have one. Sure. So in, in the treatment of the off diagonal terms, so do you think that after k is very large, it so I, I didn't get what you said. Do you think it's it's harder to to, to prove that it's little of the rest, or it's definitely giving another contribution? It is definitely not. It's definitely okay. you show that the off diagonal contributions um overwhelm the, the, the diagonal contributions when k is larger than log into the so you have an upper bound, a uh, lower bound. For a lower, yeah, exactly, a lower bound. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. so it definitely, it definitely overwhelms that the contribution. But do you think it's okay? It's probably very hard to. to um, so there's sort of two questions. One is like the exact range where the off diagonal contributions overwhelms that k factorial times into the k. Mm -hmm. Um. So we show it goes at least to log into the one third, and we show that it can't go further than log into the one fourth. I think it's kind of an interesting problem. Um, it probably involves analyzing um, th this system of equations. I mean, you can reduce it to this point, and then there's some question of um, like, I mean, the way that we handle this is sort of sort of simplistic here. But uh, we said, okay, there, there's only a solution. Um, where a11 is always determined, but it's not, not the case for any laying down of coefficients here that a11 does have a solution, so you could get an extra savings that way. But you see it's sort of a complicated system to deal with. Um, so that would be one thing. Um, on the other hand, if you're interested in, in this problem, um, I think what ends up happening 
is that for with, with relatively small probability in the XNs, these soup norms are quite large. Um, there's, there's something that happens like one over N of the time or something that the, these soup norms just grow enormously. And that doesn't really happen in the IID case. Um, so, so if you're interested in handling this, you have to somehow, somehow find a way to throw away those values of the XN, which occur with negligible probability, but you have to find a way to throw away those values of the XN where the soup norm is unreasonably large. I mean, beforehand? Yeah, beforehand, some sort of conditioning argument or something. Is it is there an easy description of, of when it's when, when it's large? Yeah, I mean, this set you said like uh, of probability one over n when the supremum is large. Oh, yeah, so we don't have any description of it. I think that would be the the right uh, exactly the right approach to find some explicit description. Uh, and how do you know that they exist? Uh, so we did numerics on it, um, yes. where you plotted the soup norm uh, comparison of this, which is the IID case. And you can see that there's some sort of tail phenomenon where with, with very small probability, this, this soup norm is much bigger than in the IID case. Mm -hmm. But numerics is all that we have there. If you, if you just look at theta very close to zero, then you have the sum of a random multiplicative function without any additive character, essentially. Yeah. And that has relatively long tails in the distribution compared with a sum of completely ID things. Yeah, so I assume yeah. you're getting some some big contribution from there. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. You have to find a way to remove those uh, remove those tails. Yeah, that, that's a good that's a good way to put it. There are there any more questions? Comments? Okay. So I think I'm going to stop to record now. <laughs>